Goedemiddag. Good afternoon. I've, I've had a few remarks about the, uh, the format of the, of the lectures. Um, because there, there are two types of listeners. Some attend the whole course, and therefore I cannot repeat every time the same information. We need to have some continuity. Uh, I do some recaps, I do, especially I do the recap uh, at the beginning of re every lecture of what was said the, the lecture before. Um, but I try to avoid repeating the same lecture uh, again and again. At the same time, some people are coming once or twice to attend one particular lecture, and it needs to be self-contained. Therefore, I require some repetition for the people who've been here before, but at the same time, I have to make it referring to a number of things that might be the background. And I, I've been told that some, sometimes for people who come only for one lecture in particular, some of the background information seems to be missing. In the um, recap, I write the, the um, salmon farting. I try to put all the information there, uh, references, so that for people who may have missed something during the, the lecture, uh, it can be found there. At the same time, of course, there are the, uh, the videos are being made consistently, and they, these may be used as a, uh, a reference of the, looking about the camera there. Um, the lectures, of course, are, uh, can, can be looked on, on the video. At the same time, you can communicate with me. You can send me emails. And uh, if you have any particular question about one particular point, of, or if a group of you would like to know a bit more about uh, something in particular. <clears throat> Another thing I would like to make a remark about is that uh, you have these readers. The readers are recommended lectures, uh, uh, readings uh, by, uh, by the uh, professor who was responsible for that particular lecture to put some, um, uh, some file together with, with information. I, I've noticed that so far uh, uh, no one has mentioned any of my own writings. And so I should, I should make sure in the future that some of my own stuff uh, gets into these, these readers in particular. Um, I, I've written on, on, the, on the subjects, the topics I'm, I'm covering in these lectures, um, I've written books, sometimes whole books on, on particular aspects. Like for instance, L'Argent Mode d'Emploi, a book written in French, is devoted entirely to all the monetary uh, questions. I've written another book called Le Prix, which is um, de uh, devoted to, um, dedicated to all issues related to how price gets formed. And also, of course, I have a set of, uh, set of books. Uh, there are now five, actually, um, devoted to the current crisis, starting with, with the one called uh, La Crise du Capitalisme Américain, which was covering, uh, it was actually a, a forecast explaining what would happen at the time I was myself working in the uh, subprime industry in the uh, United States. Last time, uh, we talked about tax havens, mafias, and the, uh, the shadow banking uh, sector. Actually, I had no time to cover the uh, shadow banking, and uh, that will have to be included in the, um, in a coming lecture. I will manage to put some of that information in one of the lectures in the, in the future. Um, but I did talk about tax havens and mafias. I talked about the uh, fiscal systems we have in our societies and the temptation for people who think that they do not benefit from that system uh, to try to evade it. Uh, I, I drew the attention on the fact that there's a tolerance uh, among uh, people at the top of our uh, societies often to this kind of, of attitude. I drew the attention also that in the current crisis, um, the people who are at the top of, economically speaking, of our, our societies uh, have been benefited in a major way from redistribution by uh, states in particular having made sure that no, none of the, moro the, the money borrowed uh, in uh, one way or in another um, to make sure that it has been uh, refunded. Mafias, I, I drew the attention on the fact that they appear on the fringe of our societies, um, essentially to deal with some aspects of society which the state fails to uh, cover uh, appropriately. 
For instance, if the um, protection of private property is not ensured, uh, ensured in a satisfactory manner uh, within the state because the state is weak, uh, private, um, there will be people who will privately offer to provide the, um, provide the service for a fee and most often making sure that um, the message is understood by uh, destroying property to start with to make it um, obvious that there's a lack of a service being provided. I mentioned also a number of domains where our societies are ambivalent. They have conflicting views which make it possible for uh, alternative systems to, to kick in. For, the, for instance, uh, the attitude toward drug usage and addiction where the uh, person who's uh, infringing the law at the same time regarded as a, a victim. There is, a, how would I say, an ambivalence there which uh, allows um, parallel systems like mafias to, to move in. There are other examples like prostitution where also we don't have a clear view about how we should deal with uh, that particular issue or um, the commerce of weapons which is usually regarded as uh, how would I say, negatively by the population, but which is also part of uh, international co commerce and some countries are very active in the uh, weaponry and the weapon mar arms industry. And there also, as far as payments are concerned, um, contracts and so on, there is, there is room for not only for mafias, but also for uh, tax havens as being the way to come through um, to come up with some, some de decision making. I was thinking also of, of the cases where <coughs> states would decide not to, um, would refuse to negotiate with um, takers of hostages, but you, the, the communication does take place most of the time, but not, not and on the surface, and go through some of these uh, shadow institutions to, um, to make it work. Today we're going to talk about something entirely different. Um, it is linked to a um, subject that I covered during the uh, inaugural uh, lecture. It is that statement which created a little scandal in 2009 when, when Lord Ader, Ader Turner, at the head of the Financial uh, Services Authority in, in Great Britain, which is the uh, regulator regulator of the financial industry, when he, when he said that it was in the, an interview in the, uh, a magazine called Prospect, he said in the, in the future, and at that time we were only a few months after a major uh, collapse of the um, financial industry which had taken place in uh, September 2008 when the um, investment bank, American investment bank, Lehman Brothers, uh, went bankrupt. And he had said, we need to look at the financial industry making a difference between these activities of the sector which are socially useful and those which are not useful. Sometimes he said, uh, useless. He, he didn't say obnoxious or dangerous uh, for the other ones, but he, um, he could have. And when he made that statement, he got, um, he got in real trouble. Some people, in, in, you, can, you can find some very offensive com comments at the, at the time on, um, on what he had said. You, you, you need to know that that person who was the head of the, uh, a major um, state-organized uh, regulation of the um, financial sector was himself an, an insider. Before that, he had worked as a, uh, as part of the uh, famous McKinsey uh, cabinet, who was a uh, research, a research um, institute, institution um, on finance. They are, for instance, the inventor of the stock option uh, system. He had been vice chairman of Merrill Lynch, another invest investment bank in, the, in Great Britain, and so on. He was very, he's very much someone who's part of the, of the system. But he got in real trouble when he mentioned that, um, when he made that, that statement of the distinction we should make between u useful and useless. Why, why got, it, he got, got he in so much trouble? Because th there is a view which has been dominant uh, in the period, let's say from the 1970s to recently, 
which is that there is no difference. There's no, you, can't, you cannot establish any difference between socially useful and socially useless within, um, within the um, financial sector. And in particular, it had been said, and I had mentioned that in the inaugural lecture, uh, that some of the famous economists had actually commit themselves to say that, to state that this, uh, such a dis uh, distinction was not only shouldn't be done, made, but at the same time was, was dangerous. I just remind you um, that uh, Friedrich von Hayek, uh, who got a uh, Nobel Prize of economics in the 1970, had said that the notion of social justice is meaningless, it doesn't have any meaning, and, sh mean and what, he, what he meant by that, by when he said that, of course, is that these, so these kind of considerations should not be um, raised when you're talking about, about finance. And um, Milton Friedman, who was a Nobel Prize a bit later, I think it was in 1970, 74, as far as I remember, for Hayek, and 76 for um, Milton Friedman, it said that any, any, any consideration for uh, whether something was socially useful or not would necessarily lead to totalitarianism, meaning by that because he had personally some, some um, sympathy, for instance, for, uh, for the military regime of uh, Augusto Pinochet in uh, in, in Chile, what he meant was 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 communism, and so that that view was quite quite common and, and quite accepted in the 1970s uh, and 80s. It was the view of Ronald Reagan at the head of the United States at the time in the 80s of uh, Margaret Thatcher in, in England. That there was what I've called before in earlier lecture that finance had claimed ex extra territoriality. Uh, as far as ethical matters are concerned. There's that general agreement that ethics is a good way in which people should think about institutions. It is good to think that medical practice is, should be ethical. It should infringe in the laws of, of morals or of ethics. But finance would be a dominant, totally different in that respect in terms that it should not uh, take into consideration any of these uh, views about ethics and, 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 and so on. And I had, in a kind of historical uh, manner, uh, gone back to the time where this, a switch had taken place. And uh, the switch that we have in mind is the one that took place in the uh, Fable of the Bees written by Bernard Mandeville in the early uh, years of the 18th century, where he claimed that there had been a confusion that what we talk vices should be regarded as virtues, and what we regard as virtues should be regarded as vices. And so that we have made um, a major error in understanding what makes societies work. And why that view? Because that's consistent with the views of, of Hayek and Friedman and, and other people of that type, that it is by pursuing in an egocentric, avid, Cupid may be way the, uh, our own self-interest that we make society work and not by trying to make a positive effort uh, to make have, have, have these societies um, operate. Of course, these views have been questioned after the crisis, the crisis of 2007 and 2008. And there's a concern that was appeared quite spontaneously that maybe we should moralize again um, finance, that maybe that view that the negative motives was not possibly the way to have things work. But anyway, so when in 2009, uh, Turner makes these remarks about socially useless and socially useful, there is, there is a wild, outspoken opposition to these views uh, from the world, world of finance. There's one particular person, and he refers to that because I think he's been, he was hurt to hear that, to hear that, that he should have been ashamed to say something like, like, like this. Another opponent tells him that by saying that he opposes the view 
that the financial sector should become as big as possible. And that person insisted that the purpose of any institution should be to become as big as, as possible, because that becoming big would be a sign of its success. And that's the way that our societies operate. And to that, he responds the following. He said, but should we say in that case that in a particular country that the companies, the electric plants that provide electricity to the nation should become as big as possible? He said, it doesn't make any, any sense. Uh, there's an optimal size for um, electric plants delivering electricity um, through the network to a, a country. And that it is in these terms that we should think of finance also. We should think in finance what is the optimal size it, it should have. And you see that view, that view is very much in the line of the way this uh, course of lectures has been called, uh, the stewardship of finance. The idea that finance is one of the things like medicine, because I used the example before. There's no need to have a medical sector as big as possible, and that would not be at the service of the community. In the same way, there shouldn't be a financial sector that tries to grow as big as it can and would ignore the idea that it should be the service of the, of the, to the uh, society at, at large. But the fact that that person says, in, in a kind of rage, that, it, you, that uh, Turner is preventing that sector from now on to become as big as it wants shows that view that finance should be a business and the business should get a market share as big as possible and that would be the way it works. It shows an essential mi misunderstanding. And the fact is that his voice of Turner is somewhat unusual, in particular if you think of his curriculum, the way he's actually, before becoming the head of that regulator, um, financial services authority, um, that he had a career, a typical career of, of a person uh, within, within finance. I've been reading, I've tried trying to put together a number of, of his uh, speeches um, in order to get a view of what exactly he, he, he means. And you will see, and I'll try to finish with that, a description of a somewhat surprising, um, a somewhat surprising view uh, he has about some part of the financial industry which he would regard as being, as being useless. I was writing about it yesterday and I made it a, a a, 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 a post on my on my, my blog that particular idea, and that, but I'll come to that. Well, I, what I will concentrate on, and I will I will give you the the, the exact reference, uh, is two in particular two of his um, of his lectures because um, I think they, they they get all the arguments that he's been setting up in different contexts. He'll, he put them together very well in these two uh, lectures. They were both in uh, 2010. There's one from the 17th of March, 2010, which is called What Do Banks Do? What Should They Do? And What Public Policies Are Needed to Ensure Best Results for the Real Economy? And the other one is called, which was a few days later only, because they, it was given in um, April of 2010, and it's called Economics, Conventional Wisdom, and Public Policy. The first one was given to an audience of um, bankers. And so it, it speaks in somewhat technical terms. And I'll try not to get into too much of that, because what I want to let emerge is the bigger picture, as we say, uh, a kind of bird's eye view, rather than go too much in the, um, in the um, technical details of finance. At the same time, I will have to mention some aspects of that. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't make, make any sense what I'm going to say. And his point would be difficult to, um, to support or to explain it's too explicit in the best possible way. The second talk is called Economics, Conventional Wisdom, and Public Policy. The, the first. You will see that what, what, what he does, essentially, and that's the, the paradox, I would say, he's extremely critical. He regards as the main culprit, and that's something similar to what I, I wrote in the, uh, my most recent book, 
um, misère de la pensée économique, that when we look at responsibilities, and of course we are here uh, in, in a course which is about ethical issues, that to some extent, I would say, often you find mitigating circumstances to people. Some people are culprits. I mean, some people are, have done very bad things, and they should be actually, society should deal with that. Um, let me give an example from, from today's news about HSBC, which is a, a, a bank, a British bank, which is, has been responsible of a lot of laundering um, money from the drug traffics, traffic in, in Mexico. Now, why is there drug trafficking? I just made a, when I, I, I talked about the previous lecture, I gave, made a remark that there might be ambivalence in our society in, in dealing with the issue of, of um, drugs. But at the same time, it is not something, money that comes from that commerce should not just go be able to go through the banking system and, and disappear with, within it. The issue now is that HSBC has been fined, very, very heavy fine of over a billion dollars, over a billion dollars. But at the same time, none of the people who are responsible of that these um, breaches in the law are taken to, to justice. And the question is asked, why is it n n the case? And you may know about that notion that was introduced about banks which are too big to fill, meaning that if they would default, they're so big that they would bring down the whole system with them. And the, um, a, a notion was used um, this morning in the paper saying banks too big too big to be indicted, um, banks which are too big to be taken to justice, and which is actually a notion I had talk and talked about in my most recent book, because it's not only that some banks are, would make the whole system collapse if they, if they were ba went bankrupt, but they could make the whole system co collapse also if they were just prevented from doing what they're do do doing. Uh, because you know that would be the classical way. If somebody has shown he cannot or she cannot do something without breaking the law when doing it, well, you just prevent them from doing it. But the system may be so fragile, so weak now, that it may not be possible just to prevent HSBC from going on with with its business without uh, bringing down the whole system. Uh, also, in the in his papers. Turner is very clear that in terms of assigning responsibility in the crisis to fraud, I would say, or to the failures of our understanding how, how the system works, he very much believes that it is a system which has not been able to understand its own, its own working, um, which is, as I said, is also the view I, I develop in that most recent book, that in terms of responsibilities, I think the illusion we had developed with economics, a science of economic facts, was actually shown not to be the, the case. And the, I would say the empirical, um, the em empirical um, proof of that is that we, we could not actually, the, the, within the economic knowledge, we couldn't predict, forecast, that a, um, that a crisis would develop. And when the cr crisis had developed, there were no means easily described by economists of what should be done from that on. I said I would go as little as possible into technicalities, but I have to start by, by reading his view about uh, Turner's view about what is what is the issue. He never he never talks about the uh, economics having uh, having been having produced a erroneous mistaken type of knowledge. But you will hear that to some extent he says something which is not too distant from there. There is a oh, there is a strong belief which I share that bad economics, or rather oversimplistic and overconfident economics, helped create the crisis. 
there was a dominant conventional wisdom that markets were always rational and self-equilibrating, that market completion by itself could ensure economic efficiency and stability, and that financial innovation and increased trading activity were therefore axiomatically beneficial. He summed up the, he summarized what is, I would say, the, the core of current economic science. And he says, it's not that it is wrong, but we shouldn't work from an oversimplified view of what that, um, m m an oversimplified view that that model really applies to the reality that we see, that we see around us. But you will see that while at the time his critic, his criticism develops, you will see that I would say that by the end, there is so little which is left standing of that, um, these views that he could have said as well that it was erroneous and, and, and mistaken. And I think that some of the trouble he's in, he's not in real trouble because he's the head of a very powerful um, authority in, the, um, in, the, in Great Britain, although he's been overlooked now uh, to become the head of the uh, governor of the Bank of England somebody else has been, has been cho chosen instead, although he was regarded as a uh, possible uh, candidate. But at the same time, I think his critical view about the um, body of knowledge that we had believed had been created uh, is very much part of the, um, how would I say, <coughs> that the way he's looked at with some suspicion by his colleagues and by the world of finance altogether. What does he, what does he say happened um, he says that what, what happened, there has been a progress from a body of n knowledge, which is called economics, or the science of economics. He says that because people didn't pay any attention to a possible sliding of that view to something else, that body has become ideology, and that's why it's been oversimplified and taken at face value, which shouldn't have happened. And he says then that transformation from ideas to ideology was implemented into policy and business practices. So he sees a process where the, f the theory is may maybe not so much at fault, but where a transformation, a stiffening of the views into what he calls ideology, and then an implementation of the ideology in, in practice led to the difficulties we are now. As a consequence, he said, a set of policy prescriptions appear to follow from that oversimplified views. Macroeconomic policy, fiscal and monetary, was best left to simple, constant, and clearly communicated rules with no role for discretionary stabilization. Their regulation was in general beneficial because it completed more markets and created better incentives. We, we did realize now in 2007, 2008, that a lot of the rules which had have been eliminated, suppressed, actually led to some of the difficulties we are, we are in. I ref when I talked about the subprime crisis, uh, subprime crisis, where I happen to be very much an actor personally, I drew the attention on the fact that some rules, some regulation that would have prevented the subprime crisis were deliberately prevented to come in, uh, in application to be uh, implemented. Financial innovation was beneficial because it completed more markets and speculative trading was beneficial because it ensured efficient price discovery of setting any contemporary divergences from rational equilibrium values. There are two views there, that financial innovation by, its, by itself is positive. And that's an implication from that uh, economic, economics, from that, that, that science. In practice, and I've mentioned, I think, that before, um, 
for some of the financial products that would, were developed in the 1990s and the beginning of the 21st century. Some of these products were invented, used, although we had no clear representation of how they operated. And in particular, in terms of risk management, we had no idea really how to manage risk for these, these uh, um, type of, of products. The, the reason why we didn't see that, it was because the rating agencies accepted to rate, to evaluate the risk associated to these products, although there were actually no method to do so. This is something that he mentioned, uh, mentions in particular. Um, he mentions something called CDO squared. CDO squared, a CDO collateral, collateralized debt obligation, is something which is made out of usually typically of 100 or 150 certificates borrowed from different um, different securities, which makes that already extremely uh, difficult to evaluate the risk because there are 150 elements which are moving independently. <laughs> And a CDO squared is a CDO which is composed of other CDOs, making it totally impossible to predict any of the behavior of that product. What did the rating agency use in order to assess risk for that? They use, I mean, if you have any notion of mathematics, they use a cor correlation or end of statistical theory. They call, they use um, uh, matrix, matrices co composed of correlation which is typically the kind of thing which may be valid for long periods of time, but can collapse within minutes and be totally useless for, uh, for long periods of time after that. So it could, it could actually give an assessment of risk when the, the, no risk was present. It was and totally incapable of assessing risk when the risk would actually uh, show up. In, in the firms where I worked, our system of risk management based on these methods didn't show anything as being, being uh, any, any threat to what was going to happen to, until the last day when the whole thing collapsed altogether. The, these tools were actually incapable to assess what they were supposed to assess, which was, the, um, which was risk. And he says, and speculative trading was beneficial because it ensured efficient price discovery. And you see, this is a... Uh, this is an, a, a major postulate, I would say, of economic theory that speculative pricing, that the pricing which appears from normal training but of speculation also is a positive element because it shows that the price will uh, be more objective. The more people are there to buy and sell and more objective the price will be, even if these people are speculators. But for people who are lay people in, in economics, for people who don't know anything about economics, when you hear about a speculative price, everyone who's heard about that phrase they knows that a speculative price is precisely not a price which is objective. That speculation brings, takes prices either much too high or much too low. Everybody knows that. But this is very typical that economic theory could not deal with that and that the view that the person in the street has quite correctly about speculative prices didn't make sense to, um, uh, to uh, economists who were following the, and now is still following uh, the mainstream economics. Um, Turner gives an example of how this didn't work at all. He takes an, an instrument which is a, uh, called um, credit default swap Credit default swap, I will not go into details, but it's, it can be regarded as a kind of insurance against the risk that you take if you lend money. If you lend money, there is a risk that the interest payments which have been promised will not be paid. And there's a risk also that the, that the sum that you lent that was borrowed by the borrower will not be repaid. A sort of insurance instrument has been created in that perspective that you could insure yourself against the risk of not being paid fully um, the uh, value, the, the, the monetary flows, the cash flows uh, linked to that instrument, meaning that if the interest are, is not paid, you could get it from your insurer between the person who sold you the credit default swap if the uh, sum is not being reimbursed, you can turn to that insurer and get the money being uh, repaid. 
typically says Turner, the value, the premium you would pay for that insurance, according to economic theory, would have been an objective assessment of the risk being, being taken. In fact, you may not, you, you do not have to be really taking a risk related to an instrument debt in order to take a credit default swap. You can take a speculative position, which is you insure yourself against a risk that you're not exposed to. You're actually betting on the fact that the value will drop and you would get the money, the payment for the risk that you've taken if the sum is not being reimbursed or the interests are not paid, you would receive them without actually having been exposed to any risk. And uh, Turner refers to papers which have looked of how objective or accurate the, the premium from the market has been in evaluating actual risk. And he shows that it, the, uh, the um, track record is appalling for the instrument, that the price of these CDS was dropping in 2005, 2007. The crisis very much started in financial, the financial surroundings and the environment of finance. The crisis did not start in 2008. It started in <coughs> February 2007. And he shows that the values of CDS, I mean, the premium you had to pay, was still going down, although the crisis had already started for six months. So he shows with that example that that view that speculative prices are a good assessment, which is a central, associated to a central view of economic science, that it's incorrect because empirically it was shown that it did not work at all. And he adds, and that's a final point on this issue, and complex and active financial markets and increased financial intensity not only improved efficiency, but also system stability, since rationally self-interested agents would disperse risk into the hands of those best placed to absorb and manage it. <coughs> there was a statement. That this, what, what it says is, is that these new financial instruments would disperse risk in the whole of society. And for therefore, if something went wrong, it would be isolated individuals who would have acted as being, the, let's say, very small, very tiny little insurance company. And the risk would have been dispersed in society. In the case of the subprime securities, I've explained in a previous uh, lecture that the, exactly the reverse happened. Because these instruments at a very high rate associated to them. They were paying high interest payments, cash flows. At the same time, they had been valued by the rating agencies as being riskless. They were regarded as riskless. They had a very high coupon, a very high interest rate associated. The banks never sold that to their clients. It was such, so good, too good to be true. They were so good, they never wanted to sell to anybody anybody else. They kept it for themselves. And so when the crisis started, there was a concentration of risk within the banks themselves, themselves, and they refused to do any business between them. The, the, the commerce between the different banks was stopped, and that was, we were at that point in August 2007, and the whole system was already starting to, starting to collapse. But what is interesting, says Turner, is that in April 2006, meaning hardly a six, this is about 11 months, 11 months before the, start, the crisis starts, the IMF, International Monetary uh, Fund, uh, excuse me, yes, in, International Monetary Fund, which is one of these two major institutions uh, at the uh, World Bank, and the IMF, in a report in April 2006, the IMF said, there is a growing recognition that the dispersion of risk, credit risks to a broader and more diverse group of investors has helped make the banking and wider financial system more resilient, more robust. The improved reliance may be seen in fewer bank failures and more consistent credit provision. And this is just hardly 
not even a year before the whole system uh, is collapsing, and a time when I was not the only one, but some people in the financial industry were writing uh, papers explaining how bad the situation had, had become. But these people sticking to what the theory was saying were, did, didn't see anything coming. Um, Turner draws the attention to the fact that Alan Greenspan, who had been uh, for uh, near 19 years at the head of the uh, Federal Reserve of the um, Central Bank of the United States, was um, in his speeches at the same time, was saying exactly the same. He said, we are, uh, we've reached altitude, we've put the uh, automatic pilot, we have now gained such a mastery of the way that central banks work that nothing can actually happen in terms of any possible, any possible accident. Turner insists on the fact that the, um, at, the, at the time, at the time he was not, he, he was not head of the uh, Financial Services Authority, but he says, we were believing the exact same thing. In regulators such as the FSA, the, what the, the, um, um, the, the regulator that he's heading at the time, he mentions that, the assumption that financial innovation and increased market liquidity were valuable because they complete markets and improve price discovery were not just accepted, they were part of the institutional DNA, part of the belief system. And that's, that's what he refers to when he talks about, of course, that economic, an oversimplified view of, economic, uh, of economics uh, led to an ideology, a belief system which is not criticized and leads to, leads to beliefs which are disconfirmed but just by opening your eyes, but that people believe because they've been told that this is the true, and of well, which I gave an example, uh, that people, everybody else, than economists know that the speculative price is far away from its, its fundamentals, from really the actual um, true value, if one may say, of what we're talking about. I will not go in all the details. I will, I will skip some of the, um, some of the points on that issue of a, um, it gets a number of examples of, um, of contradiction that should have been, been seen. He makes a reference, he refers to uh, that statement which had been uh, quite surprising at the time that um, the, the, the investment bank Goldman Sachs was accused, and it was shown that had been the case, to have developed financial products not to promote these products, not to make them of good quality, but producing products financial products that would be deliberately of very poor quality in order to ask their clients to bet on the fact that these products would have their value rising while Goldman Sachs being aware that they were of the worst possible quality, the company itself was betting uh, on the fact that the, that value would collapse and they did make money in that, in that way. At that time, Lloyd Blankfein, who is the CEO, uh, the uh, chairman, of, um, no, it's not the chairman, it's a different thing in the United States anyway. It was the real head of the company had said that he was excusing himself in the way this company was, was uh, working by saying that the company was doing God's work. And um, Turner refers to that. He says, market efficiency and market completion theories can help reassure the top executives of major financial institutions that they must, in some subtle way, be doing God's work, even when it looks at first sight as if some of their trading is simply speculation. Among the things which are useless, and I will not go into all the details of how he explains, uh, how he supports his view that uh, it is useless um, or even, even dangerous for, the, uh, uh, for finance as a whole and for society as a whole is, of course, uh, speculation. But he insists here on the ideological bias that may lead 
some of the people in the financial industry to think that they were doing God's work, that they would actually, that although what they were doing looked like speculation and looked like something that would be detrimental, damaging for the whole system, they could have convinced themselves that it was not as bad as it, as it looked. As I said, I will skip up the, some of the remarks. In particular, this. When he goes into, let's, let's go back to the, 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 to the way we can distinguish what would be uh, useful and useless uh, in, in, in uh, elements of the financial a system. I already mentioned that he, um, it, it's clear to him that speculation can, is most of the time detrimental. He insists on, the, he goes into the, that argument which has been uh, set up essentially by people who do speculation that uh, it is important that they would be there uh, on the markets because they provide liquidity. Th that notion of liquidity means, means the following. If something and I've, or some of you have already heard that, but I'm, I'm going to repeat because it's essential for the argument. Liquidity is the ease with which something which is not properly money can be transformed into, into money. Right? Um, a very good example of, um, of this currently is, let's say, gold. Gold is, you can buy with money, you can buy gold but it's quite easy to transform gold again in, into money because everybody knows about gold. Gold has been in the past used as a reference for any monetary uh, system. Money is, uh, gold is quite liquid. It's quite easy to transform in, into money, get some money in exchange <coughs> for gold. There are people prepared in banks elsewhere to transform uh, for you, gold that you show in, into money. It's very liquid. Some things are very difficult to uh, transform into money. Uh, you happen to become the owner of an elephant. It will be ex an extreme difficult process to, have, to transform it to, to, into money. It's selling it. There are some jokes about uh, um, uh, so, uh, try to sell elephants. It's very illiquid as a product, very difficult to transform back into, into money. When things go, do not work in the um, economy, it becomes very difficult for even for things that looked that look like easy to transform back into money to, um, to to do so. The liquidity disappears. If in particular the case of debt instruments, a debt instrument is a actually money that has been borrowed. The person who borrows money from you gives you a paper saying, I will pay you back on this particular date. And if it's a number of years, it will say, I'll pay you interest every six months on the period leading to, uh, to the end of the, our contract. This ensures you that you can get your money back. I mean, it says that you can get your money back. You can go to the law if it, money is not being returned and so on. But there's also what we call a secondary market for that. You can actually try to exchange that for money on the market. You can go to somebody else, and that person will replace you into collecting the money at the end of the, of the contract at maturity. And that person will collect the interest uh, that will be paid in the process. But in the meantime, that person will you simply give you money for the right to become the owner of, of that. That type of product typically you need, in order to be liquid, in order to find easily somebody who will buy from somebody to, who sells, to make that possible, we need an agreement of what is the fair price for that product. If you, if you have people who say, I will only sell you that for 90, and some other people are there who say, well, I will only buy it for 30, then you will see that there's no liquidity on the market. There's too much of a distance between at what price people are prepared to sell it and at what price people are prepared to buy it. A liquid market, what it means then, is essentially a market where the difference between the bid, what's called the bid BID, 
which is the price at which somebody is prepared to buy it, is very close to the price at which somebody is prepared to sell it. And it only needs that they get so close that they get agree on the same price for the thing to be in exchange. So this notion of liquidity, which we, when we say that it's very important, and that's part of that economic um, postulate that we need to have a system with at equilibrium will make it possible for anything which has a value in money to make it exchangeable for that, uh, for that amount. What it supposes is that we will keep an agreement very close between those who are prepared to sell at what price they would sell and those who are prepared to buy that the prices are too very close. That's called the bid-ask spread. The ask is the price which is being asked. The bid is the price which is, uh, people are prepared to, to pay. If the bid-ask spread is very close, it's very small, very narrow, in that case the market, market is, is liquid. What is not seen within that classical approach if it is that if prices become speculative prices, people who sell will be prepared to sell at these very high prices. The people who buy at these very high prices are reluctant. They will become more and more reluctant to go as high. And at some point, there will be a reversal. We'll say, OK, we're not buying. They won't be buyers anyway, I mean, anymore at that particular price. That when you go, go at the peak of a bubble, let's say on stock market, uh, a stock market bubble, the price has been going up and up, and there were buyers and sellers. And suddenly, the price which is asked, the ask price, will not be reached an, anymore. What is not being seen is that that issue of liquidity is simply that issue of having potential buyers and potential sellers which are prepared to buy and sell at about the same, the same levels. The activities that um, a bank have being able for you to put money on an account in a bank and asking the, the, the bank to send that money to an other account that you may, may be able to put money in your account today, go back tomorrow and take that money out. Let's say you deposit some money, then you go to the cash machine the, other, the following day, you can get it out. Or you can send checks to the, uh, you can make payments on other accounts through the bank and so on. These activities, the, these are part traditionally of, of a bank, um, um, what a bank does. These are positive, they are socially useful activities. Nobody else does that, and it makes your life much, much easier. Why does the bank do that? Why does it accept to do that? And often it's for free that you can do these operations. It becomes less and less free now uh, because the money that banks can make on interest is very thin now, it's very thin, and therefore they try to I get make you pay for services which were free uh, before. Why do the banks do that? Because the, mo the money which is left there on your account, and usually you leave it for a while on your account, it can actually lend it during the time it's there. It's all, it's, in principle, it's always there for you to go back to your account and get it out. Although if you've seen, if you put like 100,000 euros in the bank and you go the following day and say, I want them out, then they will tell you it takes more time. It takes more time than that. You cannot do that. You can probably withdraw 2,000 tomorrow, but not a full 100,000. Why is that so? Well, because essentially they've lent it to somebody else and they have to find a way to pay you the money which, uh, which was there. When there's distrust when people don't believe anymore that they can go back to the bank and get the money out easily, then there are bank runs. People crowd up in front of the bank and say, well, I want my money back, because they believe that the bank will not be in a position to get all the money back to the people who've put uh, the, uh, the money in their, on their account. But that, the fact that you usually leave that money for a while makes it possible for the uh, bank to lend it or part of it, because they will keep, they will keep a, a part. And there's the law uh, forces them to keep a, 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 an amount, a fraction, a small fraction. It's gotten so low now that usually it's only 2% of the amount that you've put on your, uh, on, on your account. That's another activity that the bank do. They make meat. It's called intermediation. 
the banks let, met, let meet people who want to borrow to people who are prepared to leave money there. It could be certificates of debt or deposit, just doesn't need to be just a simple account. There are different ways, but money, the banks do that. They make people meet people who have money that they can lend for a while to people uh, that can borrow money. That's an other useful activity that banks have. Another useful activity they have is that they help firms, companies, corporations to go to the market and borrow for the market. They use it's that function is called issuance. The fact of issuing debt for a, for a corporation or for a state turning to the public and say, I would like to borrow some money and um, I will pay, I will pay uh, dividends, or no, excuse me, dividends if it, no, 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 it's not dividend in that case. I will pay interest. Dividend is only, I, we, should, we should keep that term only for shares or stocks in, in a company. We'll pay interest, we'll repay the money, and a company, a bank, starts the whole process of helping a, a corporation or a state to borrow, to emit, to uh, issue, uh, issue debt. So that's an other useful thing that banks do. If banks didn't do it, other people should be doing. Other financial institutions, and sometimes banks also, play the role of insurers. Insurers it can essentially do their job because they pool, they pool risk, they put it together. They take very small risk uh, from you, like the risk that you set your apartment on fire. <coughs> it's a relatively rare event. It's very costly for you, so it's a good idea that you insure yourself. Uh, but they may, will make you uh, pay only a small premium for that service. Why? Because they can deal with, they have some reserves, and they, the, the, the uh, regulator forces them to make reserves. And, uh, but also, they won't have to pay that all the time because these elements, these, uh, these possible um, events are rare. They happen seldom, and they're independent, usually. They don't happen at the same time. It's only on time of war that whole neighborhoods uh, are set on, on, on fire. And that's why insurers say we're not going to pay in, that, in these kind of, of cases. I mentioned the instruments of debt which are being issued by, uh, by banks. They can also deal with the commerce of that. And I refer to that. I say when, once you've issued a debt, you can actually, and that you lend money by, ish, by, by buying a uh, obligation. By buying an obligation, you lend money to the, to the, the state. But you may want your, your money back. You want to do, maybe not wait for the 10 years before you get the money back. And you sell that, inst that instrument to somebody else. And in that case, there needs to be a market for that. Again, financial institutions and banks do that kind of, of business. Finally, there's another type of activity which is speculation. Speculation, he refer, sometimes he's quite, he's quite a prudent uh, Turner. He de doesn't call it speculation always. And in some of the passages I, I quoted, he calls it uh, speculation. Otherwise, he's uh, more prudent. And in particular, in that, uh, in that lecture he gives just to bankers, he avoids the term altogether. He calls it um, position taking, taking a position in a in, in market. But when he's more outspoken, when he's speaking to a more broad audience, he definitely says that that activity is not only uh, dangerous, but it is acting as a predator on the economy as, as, as a whole. So it's, I would say there's a quite, quite simple, um, simple view emerging from, from that. There are four or five functions of the banking system which are regarded as useful because nobody else provides that uh, service than banks and insurance companies. But there's one activity which is extremely uh, dangerous. It's not positive. It's not useful. It's only a flawed, a mistaken representation of economic theory which claims that it is useful. But that view has been disconfirmed by facts and also by empirical studies, like the example I gave about the uh, the price, the 
premium level of the CDS credit default swap. When you look at the facts, when you look, analyze the data, you realize that they do, do not at all represent objectively uh, the value of the, um, of the risk. They don't evaluate risk properly. And in particular, in a period where risk was clearly going up, the price of these, the, the, the amount you had to pay for the premium for these insurance instruments was, was going down. But then there's another example he gives, which is quite interesting because it, to me, in, in that case, it was quite surprising that what he gives is a useless activity for the financial industry. And that is lending money like mortgage lending money to um, individuals in order to buy, buy a house. He's not referring immediately to the, what happened with the subprime industry. He's referring to the fact that he says, when you analyze a product, uh, when you an analyze the process by which people borrow money in order to buy a lodging, you realize that what is taking place is essentially a simple process by which one generation buys housing, the whole residential real estate, buys, buys it from the generation before at an inflated price. It pays more than the people of the generation before have paid. And that's supposed, he says, that's supposed to, when we try to explain that, we says that because the price of land has gone up, and that's the explanation of, of it. But he shows that when you look at things in that particular perspective, there is no benefit, there's no social benefit for the process happening in, this, in that way. It simply means, <laughs> it simply means, he says, that one generation, in order to get money to buy a house, will have to borrow for 10 years and then the following generation will have to borrow 15 years just to do the same process. And then the generation after will have to borrow for 20 years because simply the price is going up without any particular justification. And then he says, when you look at the credit industry in Great Britain, because his figures are for Great Britain, he says you see the following, we see that actually 64% of credit in Great Britain is entirely devoted to that. So it's nearly two thirds, nearly two thirds. Why does he look into that? He says, because we have to see the implication, for instance, of asking the banks to put more reserves for the activities they do. And people will say, well, that will prevent the banks from lending to the industry. But he says, look, lending to industry, it's an interesting concept. But look, already two-thirds two of the money is being lent is for a process which is actually useless, which is simply that one generation will pay more for the same thing to the generation which is uh, coming, uh, going out. He says, well, it, it's interesting to, in one respect, it offers better retirement to the people who are retiring, but what is the benefit for society? And he says, if you add to these 64%, the fact the money would being borrowed for commercial real estate, in addition to what individuals uh, borrow for buying a house, he says then you move up to 75%, meaning that three quarters of the, of the uh, money being, being lent with, by the financial system, by banking system, three quarters in, in England is actually for these activities which are useless to the extent that it just means that the buyer, the seller will actually sell higher than he actually bought. What he shows then, he says that you have a stratification and I can, I can un understand why some of, of his audience, when he speaks of that to some other bankers, would cringe, would kind of resist to hearing something like that. He says the result is that you have two, top, two layers within a population. You have the people who manage to get into the system of buying a house. He says, well, some people inherit, but I'm not talking about, about that. People manage to buy a house because they managed to enter into that process. And over the, the years, they will actually manage to create some wealth for themselves because they will be able to resell that at a higher price than they've actually bought it. That's the one layer, he says, at the top. 
there's a other layer at the bottom, which are the people who will never manage in their lifetime to do that. They will never manage to get into that. And therefore, they will never manage really to, to improve, to make their wealth grow because they will not benefit from that. And he insists also on the fact that, uh, the fact that interest rates on, on, on a, a credit, on a house credit, on a, on a home credit, on a mortgage is not, in most, uh, most countries, it's not being uh, imposed. There's no taxation on that. And he says that contributes to the, uh, to the benefit of the, of, the, of, the, of the people who buy house. But the people at the bottom, they will never manage to do, do that. Their income, which was already low, that's why they didn't manage to get into the system, was already low, but they will never manage their wealth to grow because of the, um, inc the increase that other people, the people who might have got into the system, their, uh, their um, wealth will grow just from the fact that uh, the, um, they will be able ultimately to sell at, at a higher price. Then he says, Let's, talk, let's look at securitization, the fact that we, the, in the case of the um, mortgage industry, especially in, in Great Britain and in the United States, uh, Canada, Australia, where it's very, uh, very important. When we look now at what happened with, with subprime, there's something that looked positive from the beginning. We said, okay, we're going to make that threshold between the people who can access to property we're going to lower it. We're going to be, make it possible for people which are lower in the, uh, the income to access to a property. So we'll be able to put a larger part of the, of the population within that class that will may, may, uh, be able to make their wealth grow by having access to property. So he said at first glance, first look, it looks like it was a good process to be able to lower that and that people would n otherwise never had access to property were able to get into the system. Except, as he says, and as we know, it's only a financial bubble that makes it possible to do it. So people who want to borrow and, pe and whose income is actually too low to that it looks like they will be able to make the monthly payments, it's only if the value of the house is going so, so quickly up that it looks like there's no risk. Why? Because no risk for the bank. Because if there's any problem, the people not paying their monthly payments, the banks can seize the house. And it's most likely that at the time it does so, the value of the house will go, go, have gone up in the meantime, and the uh, bank will not make any loss. That worked until it were whole neighborhoods in the United States, which became where people could not make the monthly payment, and it became impossible for the banks to seize them all and to resell them and with a, a, a profit. So says Turner, if you look at the process for the first, the first part of it, making it possible for more people to get into that process of having acquiring property and the value of that property going up, it looked like something good. But when the whole thing collapse, collapses, it means that all these people get totally out of the system. They, they lose their property, and the property, the, the system moves to the next, next stage. There are two aspects. There's one aspect he doesn't talk at all about because he's in the Great Britain and he's not in the United States, but I'm going to, uh, to, to, to mention that. Um, the second, the second aspect. I will first mention the, uh, the, 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 the the second aspect is that when the financial system is in difficulty and it and it tries to restart the process, it will it will, it will ask people to make a, a, a more consistent, a more important deposit on the house before acquiring it. There's a figure I saw circulating uh, lately in in France uh, that. Anybody who cannot make a down payment of 40,000 euro is not regarded as acceptable uh, in the, in the, um, for the banking system currently in France. So in order now to acquire a house, you cannot say simply, well, I have a very small deposit, a small amount, and I will pay the rest back as part of the mortgage of the money I've, I've, I've been lent, the loan amount. No, now in the, current, in the current circumstances, you have to have at least 40,000 euro that to deposit in order to get into the, into the system. And that is the same in, in, in Britain, so he mentions that. The other thing in, that exists only in the United States, 
is that in the United States, you are, it's not only uh, firms, corporations who have a notation. Individuals and households have notation too. They get a notation on terms of the risk of credit, meaning how likely it is that they will refund the money and make the payments, the, the interest payments, on money, money that they have borrowed. It is a company called uh, Fair and Isaac Company, and it's called the FICO score. FICO score is exactly like the rating uh, that is done for a, of a, um, for a comp corporation. Or as you know, uh, the uh, rating agencies also assign notations to um, currently to states on their sovereign debt, on the money they borrow from, from the public at, at large. What happened is that in the United States, you put they, they, Fair and I say company developed that scale on which every household or individual is uh, being located. Uh, you have a FICO score, and that's a value between 300 and 900. And uh, at the time I left the uh, United States, my, my, my FICO score was 720, because you can know that, the bank you can tell you the, that you have that particular uh, score. And that allows you to that the, uh, any lender to you, whether you want, you want to borrow money to buy a car or buying a house, can look at your FICO score. And it will, there's something called um, risk-based uh, um, risk uh, pricing. And risk-based pricing is that the company, the um, issuer of mo money, the, the, the institution that will lend you money, will actually uh, define the rate at which you will have to make your payments, the, the interest rate, will make it consistent with your actually actual rating. The, you, the higher your rating, the, high, the higher FICO score, the less you will pay in interest on your, on your property. The, the distinction between uh, prime and subprime was assigned on that particular um, ladder. Uh, if you had any uh, credit score below 620, you were regarded as subprime. If you had uh, a FICO score above, you would be regarded as prime. And that's where these words prime and subprime uh, come from. Mathematicians had looked at, the, at the, these scores. They had looked at, at people who had not managed to pay their, repay their, uh, um, the, the amount they had borrowed. And they had decided there was a turning point at which you could actually regard somebody being a good borrower and a bad borrower. And it was just done you know, mathematically from, from looking at the, the data. And that had been set at that 620 uh, on the FICO score uh, ladder. When, when, the, um, when, the, um, when the financial institutions started, started lending money to the people who were in the f under the 620, the people who were subprime, there was a lowering. And that, the reason why, it's not that the risk was disappearing for the individuals, as I said, but that because the value of the house was going in parallel up, you could ignore more and more the capacity of the individual to be able to borrow, and you could actually simply concentrate, as far as your, the fact that you're a banker, on the fact on the value, on the value of, of the house. What happened when the, the system, the whole thing collapsed, is that, of course, after it had fully collapsed, the, the banking industry decided they would not stick to that 620 a threshold, they would raise it. They would only um, uh, lend money to people who were much higher up in the, uh, in the ladder. And that means that the people with these lower scores who could have managed in the old system before it became totally crazy, if they had the value of the FICO score above 620, they could actually borrow and get a house. Now, because the threshold had been put higher, fewer people can get into the system. And the difficulty with that FICO score system is that it's not supposed to show anything about the economy. It's supposed to be an assessment of your moral fortitude of your strength as a, as a person, as your character, to be able to repay money that you have borrowed. It's not regarded as reflecting economic circumstances, because we are in the United States. And 
anything I would say of that sociological dimension is put between brackets. It's you as an individual who are responsible for what happens. If you lose your, if you lose your job because a factory is being closed, it is regarded that to some extent it has something to do with you and then it's not something in the world outside. So as I said, Turner does not mention that particular aspect because it's not relevant for the Great Britain that he's talking about. But that's one more element that shows that one of the consequences of, of the crisis is it has upset that system that existed of a threshold between the people who are possible, who have the possibility to go into that buying a house and have their wealth grow because they got into that category. That layer has actually become now, as a consequence of the crisis, has become narrower. It's not as thick as it used to be. And so the number of people will not manage to get into that, that system will actually, actually be decreasing. Now, it was mentioned in particular in the discussion that's taking place on my, on my blog recently that demographics may actually upset that. They might be, because the baby boom generation will disappear, there might be more housing available uh, for the new gen generation below, which is actually smaller, and therefore there might be a decrease in the price in the reverse in the system. But we'll see how that be, will be developing. I'm stopping now so to allow for a couple of questions from, uh, from the audience on what I've been saying or on the course altogether. Thank you, uh, Professor Joy, for this uh, brilliant uh, lecture. Now, as you know, uh, many of the people in the audience uh, here are students who uh, follow my course on corporate social responsibility. And, and one of the, uh, I think, main observations uh, that has been made in the literature, at least the scholarly literature on uh, corporate social responsibility, is that it has been an evolution towards firms increasingly taking into account their social and environmental impacts uh, in addition to the financial bottom line. Um, yesterday, for example, I presented a paper on, um, on carbon disclosure projects whereby you see that uh, as time goes by, uh, more and more firms actually try to do something about their climate change impact, just as, as one example of, of CSR. Now, the, the, the storyline that you have described today um, would seem to be more of a pessimistic one in the sense that, uh, first to describe, of course, a very recent phenomenon, so we're talking about the crisis of 2008, whereby obviously many financial institutions were engaged in behavior, uh, that's a long term, called socially useless, but that's, in other words, socially, certainly not an expression of corporate social responsibility. But I think in addition, what, what you're describing is that uh, we seem to have learned very little. And, and so my question then is, um, do you think that um, there is now a movement away from uh, those socially useless activities? Do you think that a number of financial institutions are taking on board new avenues to engage in, in behavior that is uh, responsible from a social perspective? Or do you think on the other hand that actually things are getting worse? Yes. Well, you, you'd be happy to know that um, Lord Adair Turner is also the head of the Committee on Climate Change in, the, in the Great Britain. And he was actually at the head of that, uh, that um, commission uh, before he was assigned to the um, F FSA. Uh, of course, there is, there, is a, uh, there is an awareness and there, there's a, there, there is a change in, in mentality to, to some extent. But I will mention a fact that you probably know about a recent um, a recent, recent move by a number of German banks to decide that they would not offer their clients anymore any of the um, of these financial products which would give you a benefit if you buy it if the price of commodities goes up and will you make a loss if it comes down. One way of looking at these uh, products is of course that they are speculation on, on commodities. And in particular, uh, typically banks, when they offer you a product like that, they don't offer you just to speculate, I would say, on copper or, on, or gold or oil or something like, like that. They offer you a basket, a basket being uh, 
typically, I don't know, let's say, I think there's a famous uh, basket uh, offered by Goldman Sachs, which is 12, 12 commodities. And these commodities in these baskets, baskets may be typically, let's say, I, let's say, I mentioned copper, it would be copper, it would be uh, cotton, it will be uh, grain, uh, like wheat, um, it could be a cocoa, coffee, etc. a number of things which are linked in that basket. When a lot of people go and actually buy these products, it will produce a trend development. It will make these prices go up. So people become really interested in doing that. The difficulty we've seen in the first semester of 2008 is the price may then go up on, on cereals, uh, on, on grain, and that, that you may see, like it was the case at that time, that you have a uh, food, uh, hunger, hunger riots developing in Latin America, uh, in Africa, and in some Asian uh, countries. Deutsche Bank was offering that type of product uh, to, to its clients. Uh, a number of, uh, as I say, uh, uh, regional banks in Germany also. And uh, they decided recently not to offer these products and anymore. But what is most interesting uh, to, to me is that in the statement where they, well, they, how would I say, the press, uh, the press release that they offer to explain why they move out of the, um, of um, these markets, they say it's not because these products are speculative, but because there is a mistaken view in the opinion that they are. And uh, I think to me that's revealing because they don't, they, they, they're prepared to react what was they see as some I mean, maybe some irrational uh, feeling in in the um, in the population, but they would, will not go as far as, for instance, Laura Ade Turner goes, saying these products are speculative and they are dangerous for the economy as a whole. So what it makes me think is that there might be fashions. It doesn't look like a conversion to a new view in that case, as a good example, uh, not at the conversion to another view, but saying, well, this is the way that the public perceives it now. Uh, and I hear that in that, like the possibility of reversing the, the decision in the future, because it's seen as essentially as a product of an illusion rather than of something which is in, there in, in truth. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Yes? Yeah. Because I feel that a lot of customers are very happy to see that they are offered a higher interest rate yes. on products. Interest rate that are above market rates. Mm -hmm. And not realizing that they are, in fact, selling options to the bank, selling the products. Yeah. And selling options, not at the market price, but very under the market. And uh, that's a kind of education between banks that wants to make money on those products and uh, education which could be a protection for those banks against customers claiming that the results that they were expecting about the products was not achieved. Yes, well, in, in some legislation, some national legislation, there's a distinction being made between what is called a sophisticated, um, what's the word, actor, a sophisticated actor, and what, what is not. And the, um, the rule in that case is that if the person you're dealing with is a sophisticated actor in the, uh, in the, um, on the market, you do not have to make any disclaimer you don't have to good give explanation because they know what they're talking about, and um, and for that reason, um, well, you are equal in the business. You're selling it; it's their freedom to buy it or not at the price that you're asking. And if they do, that's it's, it's their business. There's a, a, a big discussion currently about the product that was sold by, for instance, by Dexia uh, to the municipalities in the United States. Were these people sophisticated buyers or, or, no, or not? They were offered the products, and the fact is that 
The difficulty there is that if the thing goes wrong, then you will say, well, nobody was sophisticated enough to understand what was going on. But that's not the distinction. That's where, that's one good example of, I say, where the weaknesses of the economic theory come in really in the reality. If, if the buyer and the seller were actually selling something that neither of them understood really how it worked, which it turns out to be the case, it turns out that nobody was actually sophisticated. But they can, turn, they can turn to you and say, well, what we were believing was a body of knowledge that had received a Nobel Prize in economy, and therefore we were justified to believe it, which is true, too. But the fact is that the whole, the whole I mean, and I've been acting for many years in that American industry as being a model validator, financial model validator. So it's very much an, is an issue that was my, my daily life, I would say, to deal with these particular issues. But as I stressed in the beginning, in many cases, nobody had a real understanding how the product worked. And f often, because the product had been, had been allowed to be so complex that there was no possibility to, to modelize it. But as Turner insists on the, at the beginning, within that body of accepted, admitted economic theory, an, an innovative uh, uh, product was by definition a good one by definition a good one because it was necessarily filling a hole in the mesh of the system and any more and more i would say the thinner the, the mesh the better you had the liquidity the better the system was actually was actually uh, becoming so as i said uh, i'm in the on the same wavelengths as, as as turner as being one of these persons who say what i say fraud or ignorance that looking back, and still now, because I mean, in the meantime, since 2008, you can't say that a body of knowledge has emerged that has replaced the inaccurate uh, knowledge. Most of the responsibility is due to the poor quality of the models we have, the representation we had, what, uh, what, what was actually uh, going on. In that most recent book of mine, the uh, Misère de la Pensée Économique, I go into depth into uh, one of the models being used, uh, the Black-Scholes model for the pricing of op options that was known from the day it came out as an article around 1975. It was known, it was erroneous, because there was an error. If you use it, you would see that error appearing called, in, called a smile. And the, in, in, although the or, uh, error was obvious, it was used by an industry. It was used consistently uh, when, uh, when Scholz and, um, and uh, Merton created a company that was the long-term capital investment. There was a nine billion loss when it came down. They were, benef they were actually acting on the fact that most people in the industry was, were using that erroneous model that they actually developed and for which they had received a Nobel Prize. Uh, I think this you know, encapsulates what, what is my, my view. We, we allowed a whole system to develop on something we said we understand perfectly, and I quote Greenspan, I quoted the International Monetary Fund, we know exactly how it works, and that view was totally mistaken. They had no clue what actually was going on really in the working of that, these operations. That you know, leads to, I would say, a question when you're dealing with ethical issues. If we solve the ethical issues, how much of the issue have we actually solved? We have solved that one dimension, but does it make it possible to restart the whole system simply with, let's say, bankers using the same models because they have been moralized? Or is the whole thing still as brittle, as weak, as, as damaged and we, as we think that it is now? We're going beyond the uh, other questions for it will be next time. Uh, thank you. Thank you See you much. next week.